Can we all say amen again? Amen. amen. As we draw our attention to the Word of God, if you would pray with me. Uh, Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be uh, in worship this evening. Uh, we are thankful for um, the many, many people um, that uh, serve so faithfully uh, within and through this church. Um, Father, we are overwhelmed uh, with your grace towards us. Uh, Father, as we return to a familiar scripture now, uh, we ask that we would see it anew, that the familiar would not be stale, uh, but that through the reading of your scripture that we would hear your voice. And Father, we pray that we would not be mere hearers of your word but that as we hear it, you would transform us, that as we hear it, you would give us the desire, the, the courage, the boldness to be doers of your word. We pray these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As you've heard me say the last few weeks, I am an anxious person. In my moments of anxiety, my wife Katie will tell me, well, don't be anxious. Uh, just don't. And we all know that's not very helpful. She'll say, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. My response is always, exactly. That's why I'm anxious. If I could do something about it, I would just get up and fix it. And for the last couple of weeks, I've been saying that, yes, I, I think we're on to something there, that perhaps our anxiety stems from relying on self, and prayer stems from relying upon God. And last week, I, I, I put a line through, perhaps, I put an exclamation at the end of that statement. Our anxiety stems from relying on self. And prayer stems from relying upon God. I don't make that up. I get it from Scripture. If you join me in Philippians chapter 4... We'll pick it up at verse 6. And again, if, if you haven't been with us the last few Sunday evenings, this series stems from my preaching through Philippians. It's when I got through this section, I, I realized that one sermon wasn't going to cut it. Uh, so I quickly put this series together where we could jump into this uh, to a greater degree. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. The scripture tells us, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Um, you know, the, the announcement was made this morning that I remember it was going to be an abbreviated worship in time of preaching. And as I walked into the worship center, 
I was greeted by two friendly deacons that said, Now really, your sermon is going to be short? Yeah, it is. It's going to be short. It's going to be short, I promise. Watch this. It's going to be short. Um, we, we've been looking at this passage for two weeks now. We've called this series The Glorious Exchange because in this passage we see two glorious exchanges. And we've, in the last two weeks, covered the front end of it. And now on the back two Sunday evenings, we'll look at the back end of the exchanges. But this first exchange we see that starts at verse 6, that we can come to God with our anxiety. And through prayer, He will take our anxiety and give us peace. How about that? What a glorious exchange. Why would we ever leave that offer on the table? We could take it. Our anxiety, and through prayer, we get a peace that transcends all understanding, and God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We, we covered that in the previous two weeks, and now we're coming into verse 8, where we're given this exhortation. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Then into verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Again, what a glorious exchange. We are exhorted to think about the things of God, and then as we think about the things of God, we will begin to put the things of God into practice. then the God of peace will be with you. Again, why would we ever leave that offer on the table? This one's going to take some more work, but in our short time together, I want to look at the front end of this second exchange where we're told, as I put it, this would be your fill in the blank on the backside of your bulletin this evening. We're told to ponder the things of God. I like that word, ponder. I, I, I get it personally from, from the old hymn. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. Here, the Apostle Paul gives this long list of descriptions trying to find a a word to describe the things of God. He dumps out the thesaurus, finding a way to describe the things of God. He tells us to ponder the things of God. My exhortation, piggybacking on that thought this evening, is you need to place before your ears, your eyes, your mind, the things that take your focus off the things of earth and onto the things of God. That's what we're called to do here. Put before our eyes and before our ears, before our minds, the things that take our focus off the things of earth and onto the things of God. I firmly believe that if we're focused on God's will, if we're focused on God's ways, we'll pray more. How about that? And guess what happens when we pray more? This glorious exchange where we can drop off our anxiety for the peace of God, and when we're praying more, we begin to live out the things of God, and the God of peace is with us. 
We're called to ponder the things of God. This next point isn't in the passage directly, but I think it's necessary for us to ponder the things of God. Your second fill in the blank there is to purge the things of this world. So let's work through this a little bit. We're, we're called to put before our ears, our eyes, our mind, the things that take our focus off the things of this earth and onto the things of God. And conversely, we need to remove the things from our ears, our eyes, and our minds that takes our focus off the things of God and places it onto the things of of this world. We need to get rid of those things. And this is at the point in this very short sermon that people that have been in church long enough will say that uh, I move from preaching to meddling. Oh well. Um, Just a couple of questions. Do you consume more news than you consume good news? See what I did there? See see what I did there? Uh, We can listen to a lot of news. And, and listen to very little good news. And that takes our focus off the things of God and puts it onto the things of earth. And this passage is a call to ponder the things of God and to purge the things of this world. That's a couple more questions. Do you stress more than you praise? Perhaps we need to purge the things in life that cause us stress. Do your habits and hobbies lead to worldliness or godliness? <laughs> you know, sometimes these things that in and of themselves are good. Sometimes they they get in the way of us pondering the things of God. And they consume time and effort. And they keep us focused on the things of this world. This passage is a call to ponder the things of God and to purge the things of this world. If you're still with me, give me an amen. All right, it's in this very short sermon. I, I do want to get to some practical steps. This is one of those sermons when anybody hearing these words looks at a young preacher and go, yes, that's really easy to say. Right? Easier said than done. So in our last few moments, I want to give us uh, some practical steps and um, In an effort to be short and efficient, I'm going to give you some steps that I've already given you. Uh, um, Some steps that I brought before you when we were discussing Colossians 3 and this idea to set our hearts and minds on the things above. I'm plagiarizing myself. Okay? Okay? And I do that not only in an effort to be brief, but in an effort also to be effective. If you read books on communication, it says for a large group to hear a message, you need to tell it to them seven times. This is going to be the second. All right. Uh, I'm going to be counting. I, I hope you're not. So how can we ponder the things of God? How can we purge the things of this world? Uh, the first thing I would tell you, and you're just going to have to find a spot to jot these down, um, confess your sins to God. Uh, 
and he'll forgive you. But many of us have things that are of this world and we think about them constantly. They consume our thought life. And the biblical way to get rid of them is to confess them as sin. To be specific and to name it before God. And and God will forgive you. And I, I think in that forgiveness and in this exchange with God that you'll move from being focused on the world and your focus will be brought to the will and ways of God. Think about this. Does God want you to sin? No. Does God want your thought life to be consumed with sin? No. So let's get real practical here. What what if we just confess those things as sin? and ask God to take them from us. Don't we think that is something that he'd be willing to do? We can confess our sin to God, and he will forgive us. Second thing I tell you, this seems redundant in the fact that we're looking at Uh, a study on prayer, but I'd tell you to pray to God daily. I mean, I really want to tell you what the Bible says, to pray without ceasing. But, you know, don't want to go meddling or anything like that. But pray to God daily. And, And we're working on this definition of prayer That it's this intimate, two-way conversation with God that leads God's people to the will of God. If we're wanting to ponder the things of God, prayer is a great vehicle for that to happen. And it's one of those great things of Scripture, right? The, the more we pray, the more we'll think on the things of God. The more we think on the things of God, the more we'll pray. Confess your sins to God and He'll forgive you. I tell you to pray to God daily and He will guide you. And I'd also tell you to read your Bible daily. And He will speak to you. If we confess our sins to God, He will forgive you. If you pray to God, He will guide you. If you read your Bible, He will speak to you. I don't point my finger at anyone but back at myself. Uh... We live in a day and age of 24-hour news cycles and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We can consume our day with doom and gloom. When you hear a word from God, we're filled with hope. We're filled with truth. And then all of a sudden, it's much easier to think on whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy. If we want to search for doom and gloom, we'll find it. And then if we search for doom and gloom long enough, it's all that we can see. But when we read the Word of God, 
he speaks to us. And then all of a sudden our eyes get opened to the countless ways in which God is working all around us. And then a funny thing happens. You, you begin to see God working here. And, and then you see God working here and here. And then all of a sudden, all I can see is these mighty works of God. Confess your sins to God. He'll forgive you. Pray to God daily. He will guide you. Read your Bible daily. He will speak to you. And then finally, connect to Christian community. And, and he will encourage you. You need people in your life that push you toward the things of God. You, you know, you need those people in your life that when, they're, when their name pops up on your phone, you know, this is going to be some good news, right? And this is going to be some encouragement. Right? You need some people that, that call you and you go, excuse me, I need to take this one. You know, you need people that will push you towards Jesus Christ. That on difficult days will come alongside you and speak truth to you. And walk alongside you as you follow Christ. My, my litmus test for Christian community, and I think we need a litmus test because we as church folk can get fooled into thinking that we live in Christian community because we come to church. My, my litmus test for whether you're living in Christian community is this. If you did something this week that was absolutely foolish, Something unchrist like. Is there someone in your life that would knock on your door or call you on the phone and ask you, What in the world were you thinking? That's Christian community. Someone that's going to lead you to Christ to walk alongside you, to encourage you. And you know, when I surround myself with people that are following Christ, funny thing happens, it gets really easy to think about things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and praiseworthy and excellent. Because they're always sharing those things with me. They're pointing me towards those things. Just this week, I had a moment or two of anxiety. My lovely and spiritual wife can sense those moments of anxiety. Once, maybe twice this week, she just said, without asking too much, without throwing it in my face, the simple question just came out. So are you praying? I didn't answer because I knew she was right. Uh, I walked into the other room because I knew that I wasn't thinking on things that are true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. I was thinking that it was late in the evening and I still had things to get done and I had things early in the morning and my thoughts were not consumed with the things of God, but my undone to-do list. Because, at least for me, 
Anxiety stems from relying on self. Prayer stems from relying upon God. If you'd pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for this group gathered here this evening. Um, I thank you for um, the glorious exchanges that we find in Scripture, that we can bring our brokenness to you and you make something of it. And that we can bring our stress, our worry, our anxiety, the, the mess we've made of things, and we can bring it to you and you provide peace. You pick up the broken pieces. You provide redemption and restoration. Father, as your church, we come to you now, thankful that you are God and we are not, that you are the one with all the power and all the wisdom. We confess our dependence upon you. Father, our our presence here this evening is a symbol of us bowing before you. We cry out for the help that only you can provide. Father, I pray that as we are filled with peace, that that peace would be contagious, that we would spread it among our our family and our friends and our co-workers and our neighborhood. May we be a people of peace that comes through prayer. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus.